So everyone wants to know, yo, can I come to Baltimore and get a dollar get a house for a dollar? <laughs> To that, what do you say? Oh, Baltimore can be built up, but at the same time, we've been waiting on Baltimore for 20, 30 years. Lord. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of the OPA to OPM podcast. I'm your host, Dave Mill, my co host, Alex and Markel. What's going on? Yo, sir, yo, yo, on? what it do? Hey, how y'all feeling today? It's another great one, another great day. We got stuff going on, but we're going to. We gonna... Oh, yeah. This is going to be a very insightful episode. I'm really excited for this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, I'm blessed. It's, yeah. it's going to be That's a all great, I can say. exactly. It's going to be a great episode, and we're going to definitely uh, touch on what you got going on again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> part, part but we, yes, but we have a very, very special guest. Um, someone who's been a mentor to me and Alex, and someone who's, who's very knowledgeable on the subject matter we're going to speak on today. And Mr. Tony, tell how you feeling? Hey, I'm great, brother. I'm in here. I'm great. Thank you for coming, man. Most definitely, most definitely. Um, thank you for your time, man. It's, uh, your time is ver very viable, so we very appreciate that. Yeah. And what is it that you do, and how long have you been doing it? So, I, I love when people ask that question because uh, you know I'm a serial entrepreneur. Okay. Um, I've been doing entrepreneurial things since I was about 12 years old. Wow. Um. My first business, I had a uh, grass cutting business that started as a grass cutting business before it started as home services, where I had all my friends in the neighborhood working for me. <laughs> okay. So uh, we was painting houses and cutting grass and doing all that good stuff. And that evolved over my early years into eventually where I was always considered the smart thug where I grew up at, right? Smart so, thug, okay. Yeah, because I grew up in Southeast DC. I, didn't, um, I couldn't see that. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so atrocious. it was crazy because back then, you know, I mean, I'm messing with computers and stuff before computers were huge. Right. right. Um, but I always had the latest and greatest software. People ask me where I got it from. I'm going to hop on a bulletin board service. I'm not sure y'all don't know what that is, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. you know, so it was, a, it was a little bit of a different game back then. And when the internet, First kind of showed up around about 94, 95. Um, I started messing around with the internet way back then. Mm -hmm. Off for me. And in 99, when I graduated um, high school, ended up going to college, um, kept up with the graphic design, came back to the area after leaving school fairly early and being employed at Kinko's, which now everybody knows as FedEx. Right. Um, Came like signing banners and a manager, an assistant manager, and that grew. And I was looking at the money I was making. I was like, I'm not getting paid enough. I was making like forty five thousand dollars a year. Um, and outside of that, I had all this other background. So, basically, at about twenty years old, I launched something called SameDayFlyers.com um, and SonicPrint.com, mm -hmm. and that took off. Okay. That took off. Um, so that was at 20 years old. That took off. But prior to that, the previous year at 19, my father, who had been in real estate since I was a kid as a real estate agent, actually had helped me buy my first property. Mm. So I bought my first property at 19 years old. Um, when I bought that first property, we ended up fixing it up. It was a, a VA foreclosure. And back then, you could actually finance with VA even if you weren't a veteran. Damn. Correct. Correct. Damn. So if it was a foreclosure. So I basically got 100% financing on that property. We fixed it up out of pocket, and I ended up making my first major check, which was like twelve grand. Damn. Um, at 19? At 19. Mm. That's a lot uh, of money for a 19-year-old. Right, too. right, right. No so, problem. you know, seeing twelve grand from that property – at the same time working at Kinko's, I'm like 45, 12 grand, mm -hmm. something not adding up. Mm -hmm. So um, Kinko's actually, I took part of that 12 grand and launched samedayflyers.com. It took off. I started making about two grand a, a week from my one bedroom apartment. Wow. Let's get into like what we want to really talk about today. Yeah. Uh, because Baltimore is in the national news right now. Not just because of the uh, unfortunate bridge incident, but because one dollar houses. Yes. Got a lot of people like I'm seeing IG flooded from national <laughs> influencer, real estate influencer talking about this. Um, so everyone wants to know, yo, 
can I come to Baltimore and get a do- <laughs> get a house for a dollar? <laughs> to that, what do you say? So, first of all, let me tell you all, and I'm gonna look right at you, right? <laughs> um, Baltimore is great, but know who you're following and who you're listening to. Unfortunately, there's a lot of fake gurus out here and actual gurus out here that's giving out a lot of misinformation, okay? Mm. Um, When you're not intricately involved in the city and truly understand a market, you shouldn't necessarily speak on it until you truly know. Uh, So let's dig into it. 100% the program is real. Mm Mm-hmm. The Dollar House program in Baltimore was actually around in the 1970s. Mm. It's the first time it was around. Um, and I was told by a gentleman that uh, he was the head of the inspection office uh, in Baltimore. There's one developer back in the 70s that purchased about 150 houses in Federal Hill back then for $1. Mm. Wait. All together? 150 houses in Federal Hill. So he bought the houses for $150. $150. No, that's crazy. That developer now is one of the largest in Baltimore City. I bet. That family's billion-dollar family. Um, so it is a great opportunity. However, let's put it in perspective for today. Okay. Uh, head of City Council, Nick Mosby, he proposed this program slightly different than the way it's rolled out. Mm-hmm. Uh, back in, I think it was 2020, 2021, it was proposed that it would be a, $1 to lease a property for two years. You would lease the property for two years, and then during that time, you had the right to fix it up. Hmm. That's the way the program was proposed back then. It ended up being the way it is now. So you can acquire a property for $1 as an owner-occupant if you're planning to occupy the home. You have 12 months to fix that home up and move in. Let's talk about some of the challenges. Okay. Um, I live about two blocks away from the permit office. On average, it takes me just to get a permit for one of my projects about 30 to 45 days. Mm. Okay. On average, it's going to take a person for these major projects a minimum of 45 to 60 days Mm. to get a building permit. Two months. That does not include the time frame to actually acquire plans for your project because all of these projects will need a structural engineer and an architect to actually do plans. That being the case, it's more than likely going to be three to four months before you actually can start construction. Mm. So, yes, you can get a house for a dollar, but you have to know what you're doing. Mm. Now, um, I recently actually put out, uh, recently just put out a video um, on my IG and... I was out at three different properties where I show people what they look like, what the neighborhoods look like. One, to give you an idea, had a tree growing inside the house. Yep. Seen those. Yep. Another one, it certainly told me the house was there. (laughs) 602 (laughs) Cary. I go there and there's no houses anywhere to be seen. On the block. On the block. So, again, if you don't know, you don't know. So, question, is this something where you can choose, or is it a lottery of where you get to acquire that house? So, there's a few qualifications. The first thing is, it's going to be a challenge for most, is you have to have $90,000 in liquid capital as a homeowner or an investor to be able to purchase one of these homes, mm-hmm. okay? Is there a certain time period? Because like when you go to buy a house, they want to see it, like just say, hey... Let it season for a mer- certain This is before, there's no timeline, but before your application is approved for you to actually buy a home that's available now, there's a total of about 900 houses that's going to be sold, okay? Of course, we talked about this number of 13,000. Mm-hmm. Understand, Baltimore City only controls, of that 13,536, about 1, 1,000 yeah. houses. Damn. Okay, they only control. That means what? they only own about 1,000 yeah, houses. Yeah, I mean, the rest of them are privately owned. They're privately owned. That's what I'm owned. saying. What? Yeah. Okay. Baltimore City has put in new uh, guidelines where they're looking to increase the property taxes on those vacant homes and blighted homes so they can put enough liens on them so they then can take them through a, full, a special docket that they created at the court last year to expedite basically taking these homes. Mm-hmm. But there's a couple 
challenges with that because they have a limited budget too. When you take a home, you don't you don't just get it for free. Right. You still got liens and other stuff to pay off. Um, so with that being the case, there's about 900 homes that's going to be available for a dollar mm-hmm. for owner occupants and for community land trusts. Right. Okay. Uh, nonprofits are going to be able to purchase those same homes if they want to for five hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, investors are going to have to wait ninety days mm-hmm. before ninety days to give owner occupants the opportunity to buy right. first. And Baltimore residents, correct? And Baltimore residents. When right. does this start? This program has actually already started, so you can start submitting your application now. Oh. Okay. So you can start submitting okay. your application now. As of April 1st, they're going to start reviewing applications from April 1st through July uh, of those applications that have come in. So, so real quick to the money situation, because there's, I was just talking to some friends, like some, some people that like actually well connected. And they're just like, yo, these guys at these upper echelon uh, statuses and people who've come from money, they just get a gift, right? Is that is there the is there a task force or is there a way that they're checking to see where the money's coming from or is it something where it's like all right as long as you just got the money we don't care where it came from you good I can't tell you that because I don't necessarily know okay okay if you have to source the funds in a particular way I do know that you can also participate so for instance like they have. If you go through Live Baltimore, you can qualify for a grant as a Baltimore City resident called Buy by, by, by the Block. Okay, mm. uh, that particular grant will give you twenty thousand mm. dollars. Okay, so that means now instead of you needing ninety, you need now you're down to seventy. Uh, there's another organization, um, Neighborhood Services of Baltimore. You can get a twenty thousand dollar rapid rehab loan from them. Okay, so that's another twenty thousand. Now you're down to fifty. Mm. Okay. In targeted neighborhoods, healthy neighborhoods, they have 72 particular neighborhoods. If a home falls in one of those neighborhoods, you can get a purchase and rehab loan from them if you qualify. Um, mm, so you can get a loan to do these? Potentially. Potentially. Now, but this is the other challenge. One of the major challenges is we all have heard of appraisals, right? Correct. Yeah. Many of these neighborhoods, it's going to be a challenge for these homes to actually appraise mm-hmm. for the amount of money that it's going to cost to renovate them. Yeah. On average, most of these homes are 1,500 plus square feet. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right now, the average cost to build in D.C. is about 200 to $225 uh, a square foot. Mm-hmm. In Baltimore City, on the low end, if a home has floor joists <laughs> and stuff <laughs> that you can use... As I said, some of these houses, they got trees growing up in them, right? Mm, But on the low end, end. if you got some bones to work with there, you're looking at $100 a square foot. So 1,500 square foot house is 150 grand. Just that's before mm. your soft cost. If you don't have any bones, right. then you're looking at what 150. One, you're probably looking at 200 thousand dollars to renovate. Mm. You know, because yeah, you're looking at 150, 150, maybe as much as 175 dollars a square foot. Listen, there are opportunities. Yeah. There are opportunities. Um, you know, I was speaking with someone on Sunday. We were out looking at properties, and uh, she's from Baltimore, and she was sharing with me about um, a family friend of hers that purchased one of these dollar houses uh, years ago, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That home, I think she said, was 4,000 square feet. It's worth about a million dollars now. Right. So it's possible. Right. It's possible. It's possible, but it's not for mm-hmm. everybody. Mm-hmm. Um you need to have the right intentions. Mm-hmm. As an investor, if you're going to do it as an investor, you need to have the intention, not to fix and flip this bad mm-hmm. boy. You need to probably have the intention that first thing, I'm going to rent it. Right. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a buy and hold. Mm-hmm. Now, if you come out the other side and it appraises, right. then you can fix and flip it. Mm-hmm. Right. But as an investor, buy and hold. Mm-hmm. As an owner-occupant, you have to occupy the home for at least five years. I think they're going to put deed restrictions in place, mm-hmm. meaning that if you sell it within that five-year period of time, a lot of the equity is going to probably go back to the city. Right. They'll probably put some other type of uh, building uh, building license restriction on it because you're supposed to have a rental license. Yes. Yeah. So again, so you know, Westmore is from Baltimore City. 
So Westmore being from Baltimore City, we're really in a scenario where you you have someone that has an interest in seeing Baltimore City do well. Mm-hmm. In addition, for anyone that's been watching, uh, the news reference to Francis Scott Key Bridge and the collision there, uh, you may have noticed that Brandon Scott, the mayor of Baltimore and Westmore, are very close. That's his protege. Mm-hmm. So when you see that, um, you see the area of opportunity. There's a lot of money already coming into the city. Um, and as that money flows into the city, we're going to see great things happen. We'll see great things happen. So I'm really excited to see what's going to happen over the, in particular, the next three years. Now, one of the major things that could set us back is if nationally or internationally economic, we have a major economic downturn. Mm -hmm. Baltimore City is in a very fragile state. Okay. And what I mean by that is that it has it's picking up momentum, mm-hmm. but it's almost like a freight train. Until it really gets up to speed, you need all of that power to keep pushing. And right now, um, it's it's being pushed. Mm-hmm. But if we unfortunately have an economic downturn, mm-hmm. a lot of that momentum is gonna gonna go away. A lot of the investors can disappear. A lot of the developers can disappear. Mm-hmm. A lot of the government money can disappear. Right. I will say this um, as something, because I'm putting my money on Baltimore. Yes. Right? Because I just feel, especially for black folks, like, that's the last frontier on the East Coast. That's it. It's the last frontier. That's DC it. is gone. Philly, damn near gone. Gone. New York, gone. Yep. So, like, if you're interested in real estate and you want to change... The, your your family, uh, you know, uh, economic condition. Um, honestly, black folks on the East Coast economic condition, like, yo, honestly, I kind of, you say it's in a fragile state, like some of the developers may go. I say, man, get the fuck out. Honestly, yeah, let us, let, hey, black folks, let's go. Let's take this motherfucker. Let's take and this I'm, city. And I'm okay with that attitude, but I will say this. You want the large money mm-hmm. because you want to follow the money. Right. Yeah. So when you follow the money, you rarely lose. Mm-hmm. So if you see a neighborhood where they're getting ready to put up 50 units, 100 units, follow the money, buy in the neighborhood. Why? Because that means the roads are going to improve. Mm-hmm. That means there's going to be street lighting there. Grocery so you want to follow the, follow the money, right? Um, don't be a lone ranger. I've been there. I've done that. I've learned that lesson. I've been in neighborhoods where, you know, I've lost money simply because I was first. I've been in neighborhoods where I made money and set the market price where other investors came back and killed it because I I was the Lone Ranger. Mm -hmm. So you got to make sure you follow the money. But I will say this. You're on to something because it is the last frontier. Baltimore City is the last frontier on the entire East Coast, there is no other city, major city, like Baltimore. It is the largest shipping port on the East Coast. Mm. You have the most automobiles delivered in Baltimore City than anywhere else in the entire United States. So there is a lot of activity, economic activity there. Under Armour is based there as they continue to grow. Mm. You know, they just issued... Yeah, they just issued Steph Curry his own brand inside of Under Armour. There's going to be opportunities in the city. John Hopkins has continued to expand. There's many other hospitals there. You know, as you mentioned, tech is potentially coming. You know, so there's opportunities. But as a whole, it's still in a fragile state. Because we're in a fragile state as a country right Right. now. Yeah, right. I was going to say... uh I, it's not really an opinion or to disagree or agree, but I guess more so a rebuttal. What is it necessarily bad that um, if DC didn't, I mean, not DC, but Baltimore didn't stay as that, you know, last black home front? Because, Gosh. I mean, yeah, we got, um, damn, what was it uh, when they say, you know, gentrification. Yeah, gentrification yeah. and everything, but. The economic benefits that have came from it, the decrease in crime and, you know, all those things is, I, I would say, has a more positive effect than negative effect on the city. I think it's just more so 
how you were just saying, we got to be educated and, you know, know we're not only where to follow money, but how to follow the money and what to do, you know, when those type of opportunities arise. Because the same things, where's going on in D.C.? We just didn't know, yeah. oh, to buy the property or our families that own most of those properties in D.C. got brought out for such a low price because mm-hmm. they got waived this fat check that they ain't know five years later, your three hundred thousand dollar property is really worth one point two million, mm-hmm. but you didn't have the proper education, so yep. you jumped the gun. So I, that's, I, it. I, that's, that's why it. I, that's where more so my mind is at. I can't really say like, you know, gosh, you know, you would hope and want to see an all black community I, or all black city, it's but not it's not gonna happen. So it's I, not realistic I, 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 I to let me. Tony answer that. Then I'll. I'll because I have an opinion on what you just yeah, said. But it's, it's just not it's, realistic. It's not going to happen. It's not realistic. So you got two types of gentrification. This is where most of black people in particular get it wrong. Mm. Right? Okay. We think gentrification just means that there's a racial mm-hmm. component to it. Gentrification is also a major income component to it. Mm-hmm. Educate me, my brother. What does that mean? Let me give you an example. Okay, just because there is going to be gentrification in Baltimore and there is going to be gentrification is already occurring. Right. What that really means in particular for Baltimore, where almost 80 percent of the population, it's crazy, almost 80 percent of the population rents. Mm -hmm. Okay, it means that unfortunately, most of those renters are going to get pushed out. That doesn't mean that black people that are middle income, upper income are not going to come in and take advantage mm-hmm. of buying here. Or raise okay. the, the property taxes and exactly. tax base. That has happened in D.C. In D.C., there is a lot of black money here. Mm-hmm. You know, people say, uh, say uh, this is like black Atlanta in D.C. with degrees, right? Mm-hmm. It's one of the highest, most educated places on earth in Washington, D.C. And you have a huge African-American population here, but they're well-educated and they are high income compared to the rest of the country. Mm-hmm. Prince George's County, it's the <laughs> wealthiest, predominantly African-American county in the entire country. Second now. Yeah, well, uh, Charles, well Charles, Charles County, County has. <laughs> and, and, are you, you, is... you going to count Ward off now? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and simply, uh. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. It's the same thing that we're referring to here. Because Waldorf in Charles County used to be what? Predominantly white. white. Predominantly yeah. white. Man, it wasn't. But the major thing that occurred, they saw building houses that were less expensive. And individuals got priced out of D.C., Prince George's mm-hmm. County. And they said, oh, I'm going to move out here even if I got to sit in traffic because the major it's arteries worth- are always clogged. I get more for my bang for my buck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that's why now you got individuals that still work in D.C. <laughs> that live all the way in Charles County. Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing in Baltimore City, and I alluded to this earlier. I said there's one thing that could be a major game changer Megalith. for Baltimore City. Megalith and high-speed train. Mm-hmm. Elon Musk was a part of the initial program to put high-speed train from basically all the way from Richmond all the way up to New York York City. To New York City. Okay. It's a a heavy lift for the federal government because a lot of private land involved. It's it's, it's a major challenge. Now, Amtrak is already working on a high-speed train. However, anytime I'm over in Europe... And I and and I had the opportunity to catch the high speed train from London to Paris. Mm-hmm. Okay, so anytime like you're on a high speed train it's going like 200 place. miles an hour and you're able to get somewhere in a few hours, mm-hmm. that's that far away. It's a game changer. So if you're able to get from Baltimore City to DC in 15 to 30 minutes, <laughs> that's Dude. faster than a car. I would say 15 minutes because you can get. Depending who's driving. You cannot get from Baltimore City anymore. I could do it when I was at Morgan in 99. Uh But now it is an average. Because I used to make the drive. I put 70,000 miles on my car in the course of 18 months. Mm. Going back and forth. It's 45 minutes minimum to Mm. get from D.C. to Baltimore City in a car now. Mm. Because of traffic. Mm -hmm. So if you eliminate that, if you can get to 
major employment centers, Philadelphia, D.C., New York, or New York City. In an hour or less. In an hour or less, where individuals can make that income, and just like in Charles County, buy property at this much lower price point, it's going to redevelop the city overnight. So it's uh-huh. like uh, why people, because uh, I got a lot of, uh, I work for government as well. Yep. Yo, a lot of my coworkers get the salary here, mm-hmm. and if they go on telework or not, they might move to Houston. But most of them recently have been buying all this property in West Virginia. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm like, and I'm like, why y'all buying houses in West Virginia? And they're like, you know, it's only an hour away. I'm like, nah. For if real? you think back yes, to something yeah. I said at the very beginning, when I was alluding to the fact that I was a mortgage loan officer mm-hmm. that was doing loans in, in DC. Washington D.C., making commissions that were equivalent to the prices of homes here while living somewhere where I was able to build my first 3,000 mm-hmm. square foot house for $235,000. That's where I bought mine. Okay? Mm-hmm. And my monthly payment at that time was $1,400 a month. Okay? Shit. So when you think of it that way, you're like, okay, that is what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm talking about. Because now you're talking about you can buy something in Baltimore City and you can own and be paying for a major, a lot of square footage in a major city Mm -hmm. where eventually you will have entertainment, where eventually it won't be a food desert, where you will have all these other options to be able to enjoy life. But you're living for less than $2,000, $2,500 a month. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I have a listen in D.C. right now. It's a three bedroom, two bath, two and a half bath condo for $1.2 million. Yeah. Yeah, not about right. Yeah, but you're gonna be able to get three times that square footage in Baltimore City for two fifty. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. I kind of want to touch on that, uh, what you said, Michael, as well. Um, as as Tony said, gentrification is not a bad thing, but at the end of the day, who said that black people can't participate in gentrification? Mm-hmm. Right? It's because it's being gentrified. Why can't I fix up the block? Why yep. can't I, you know? And then. I'm, I'm fixing up the block for my people. That's you, it. You know, I'm uh, and I'm raising the property taxes. I'm raising this the city tax uh, base. You know, by bringing in my people as well. You know, so just because it's justification doesn't mean that black people are gonna get left behind. And 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 one thing I'm gonna just piggyback off of that real quick. So I'm one of the few realtors that just recently got certified, right? right. Real estate agents that just got certified as a Section Eight. Most people know it as Housing Choice Voucher Mm -hmm. Realtor. What does that mean? In Baltimore City, Housing Authority has a program whereby an individual that has a Housing Choice Voucher is able to buy a property using their voucher. How does that look? The government will pay whatever they were going to pay for rent Mm -hmm. for 15 years towards your mortgage on owning a property. The benefit of this program is that a person that they're trying to stop systemic Issues with people that have basically been in a scenario where generation after generation is just goes back and on Section 8. Mm -hmm. They're trying to stop that. Mm -hmm. They're trying to let these individuals build equity, build something for their family. So that being the case, they're already coming up with ideas and programs to give individuals in Baltimore City the opportunity to participate, come out of that rental idea and move into ownership and be a part of the city growth. I think it's a it's on us to educate. It's on us to make sure we yeah. help pull up the bottom in our community um, and don't look for anybody else to do it. It's on us. It's on us. I mean, as African-Americans, we have to take responsibility for us. Can't look for anybody else to do it. Yes, we're old stuff, but right. it's on us to make yeah, sure it's we do it. complex. It's, a, yeah. it's up to us to uh, get our own reparations. That's it. Yeah, and, and that's all I was saying. More so, like I, I, I agree with you, like a mm-hmm. thousand percent. It's just more so, like to me, like I, I think from a logic point of view. So it's like, like I said, bro. For me, it was just like, is it realistic? I don't see it right now. But educational piece is the most mm-hmm. important yep. piece because. Exactly. Like you say, it's a lot of programs that we aren't aware of as a community, or it's a bunch of stuff that we lack financially as uh, in the literacy space, you know, educational, educational wise. So let me let me give you let me give you a little piece of how simple this is, right? Baltimore City, 
Let's say that you decide to go get a job at one of the hospitals, John Hopkins in particular, okay? You decide to work at John Hopkins regardless of what job you can get, janitor, cook, doesn't matter, whatever. You work there. Baltimore City has something called live near where you work. You can get $10,000 mm. as an employee of the hospital. Then you can go buy a property in the city that qualifies for something called vacants to value. That's another $10,000. Mm. Okay, so you got $20,000 to go buy a property. You're giving me ideas, son. Okay. You're giving me ideas. Right? <laughs> then you turn around and you say, hey, okay, well, I'm going to use this extra money because it's not going to all be needed for closing costs, and I'm going to buy down my interest rate mm. as low as I can. Or I'm going to go over to you know, one of the other programs in the city. I got a lot of financing programs where you can get a below market interest rate, mm. healthy neighborhoods being one of them. Mm. It's 1% lower <laughs> than the market rate. Mm. So, I mean, you can set yourself up simply by making sure you're tapping in with individuals that have the right information. Stop relying on people that's not going to give you the full story and work with individuals that can give you the full story and educate you as someone that's trying to get into the city. Right. So how do, how would, I mean, I kind of know, like, I know exactly what you're saying. I, you, of course, this is our mentor. So we, we know what you're saying. We know how to find someone like you, obviously, but. For the listeners and for the viewers, how would we go about doing that? So first thing is, of course, you can always reach out to me. Uh, I'm everywhere on social media under Urban Life Expert. Uh, so you can definitely look that up. Um, you also can tap in with Live Baltimore. That's another great uh, resource. Just look up Live Baltimore. They're a great resource. They have access to all these programs. You can reach out to a local lender mm -hmm. um, as well. You can go on Eventbrite, look for local uh, real estate agents and real estate meetups right. uh, that are having uh, informational sessions, attend those. Mm -hmm. You can find this information mm -hmm. if you want the information. You know, if you're on IG, TikTok, <laughs> Twitter, LinkedIn, um, any of the services out there, mm -hmm. go to YouTube. And just look up Baltimore real estate. Right. All right. So yeah, my bad. I ain't even trying to cut you off, but you know that's how we kind of started it. Episode. How do you more so uh, distinguish the difference between the false information and you know the purus and the real Ooh, actual crazy. gurus? Yeah. I so know, right? <laughs> it, it's, it's it starts with a few simple questions. Have you been to the market? Do you invest in the market? Have you sold houses in the market? <laughs> uh, do you live in the market? Okay. Ask those questions. Find out their background. Find out their history. There's a lot of individuals that are out here claiming that haven't done nothing. And then after that, ask them for receipts. How do you get receipts? Simple. Testimonials. Right. I'm sitting here with two people right now. You haven't been to my projects, but they've seen physically... My projects been in, in the, the walkthrough. Okay. The mill has set in one of my properties where you could look up at the ceiling from the basement <laughs> because it was nothing inside. And now it's a full house. You right. know, so when you have real receipts, that's, that's it. The rest forward. Because a lot of people have been basically going back and forth where it's like, oh, Baltimore can be built up, but at the same time, we've been waiting on Baltimore for 20, 30 years. Longer than that, right? Um since the eighties, it, it, it really goes way back before then, and I, you know, uh, it's crazy because I was sharing the history with someone, and I, and I, and any market that you go into, you really want to dig into the history of the market, okay? And when I say the history, I'm not talking about the last 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. You really want to go back. So when we look back, going to 1910, where the whole city of Baltimore caught on fire, mm. most people don't realize that, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and then you get into the civil rights movement where Dr. King was killed and you had the riots, okay? So then right after the riots, <laughs> where you got most of the city burnt down, then where most of the country had a crack ep epidemic, in Baltimore you had a heroin epidemic. Mm -hmm. So you had all these individuals in the 70s into the 80s addicted to heroin. Then you had, in between that, into the 40s and the 50s where you had white flight and all, all basically 
predominantly Caucasian population moved to the county because they were saying you're providing all this. So how do you end up where you are now with vacancy and dilapidated houses and all of that? It really, you got to understand the history back then to know how to get to where you're going, right? right? So um, when we talk about 20, 30 years, yes, you're looking at that. But I look back, I went to Morgan State in 99. Only did a semester and left because of Baltimore at that time. <laughs> to give you an idea, there was open air drug markets. A lot of people familiar with the corner and the wire and all of that and homicide. These are all shows that have been shot in Baltimore, right? Uh, so when you look at that, that stuff was based off of real life there. That is not like Marlo was a real person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not fake stories. So when I got there, there were open air drug markets. Literally, the police would sit on one side of the street mm. while the drug dealers served on the other side of the street. Mm. I was speaking to uh, my sister-in-law who's mm. in the counseling uh, area, and she used to counsel individuals mm. in the space up in Baltimore. And in fact, there were certain days of the week where her boss would be like, we can't go this particular day. Because these are the days that the dealers serve. Mm. You would go to Baltimore and literally the dealers would just throw out bags up in the air, let people sample the product mm. so they can continue serving. This, so this is where you're coming that's from. Crazy. This is kind of like they cover this. I think I know what you're talking about. They covered this in the wire where they had to open. Uh, it was a, basically they can't you can't be arrested for exactly. serving in this area. Exactly. So, yo, what? that is a dope. There's exactly. a lot of there's a lot of references to pop culture and the stories you said. Yeah. I think when you understand the history, then you start to understand how you're gonna get where you need to go. Mm -hmm. So when people say, "Ah, oh, it was 20, 30 years ago," we were still coming out of a generation that unfortunately was still part of that heroin epidemic. Mm. We are finally one generation removed from that. One generation removed from that. How are we one generation removed from that? Meaning that you had crack babies and heroin babies that were born in the 90s, 80s and the 90s. Right. Now, those individuals have kids where they're not dealing with those same addictions. They're dealing with some of the same uh, systemic issues mm -hmm. as a community, mm -hmm. but they're not having facing those same addictions. Right. So now that they're not facing those same addictions, you're dealing with individuals that have a clearer mind that you can start dealing with the social change now. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are. We can start dealing with the social change. Mm -hmm. So Baltimore is making a big push to deal with social change mm -hmm. as well as starting to revitalize mm -hmm. from the government mm -hmm. top down and not just at the city level, but and not just the state level, at the federal level down. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's a good possibility that it's going to make some serious progress this time. And it's making serious progress. Baltimore has always hovered around 16,000 plus vacant units. I was just at a conference last week with Alice Kennedy, who is the head of the uh, Department of Housing in Baltimore. And um, Baltimore is at 13,536,000. Mm. Vacant houses right now, but that's it's, it's the first time it's, it's been there it's, since 2018. Yeah, it's, it's dwelling, yeah. it's coming down, yeah. So it's still a lot, right? <laughs> but it's coming down. So you want to get in now if you're gonna get in, yeah. And you, you, you know, it's not a thing, you know, a lot of people they 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 look at this and they're like, oh, I want to get in, I want to get in, I want to do this, I want to do that. You have to come in with a strategy, right? Because it's still a lot of vacancy, it's still a lot of challenging neighborhoods, mm -hmm. it's still a lot of challenges in Baltimore, mm -hmm. it's as we all block. know. Yeah. It's block by block. But there are beautiful parts of Baltimore all over. I yeah. mean, you get up into Roland Park and Charles Village, you get over the Canton, Federal Hill. Mm -hmm. There's areas where you have million dollar houses in Baltimore Hampton. City and people don't Hamden. People yeah, don't Hampton. realize this. Yeah. People yeah. don't realize this. But because all they see is row houses. Is row houses that's boarded up. Mm -hmm. But again, Baltimore is huge. It's a metropolis. They, got, mm -hmm. they have a, a visualization, visual a depiction like the wire. Yes. That's, that's all it is. That's all it is. And that's all it is. So when you think about the size of the city, for those that are in the 
that ha have ever been to D.C., mm -hmm. think of D.C., Northern Virginia, and Prince George's County put together, and that's the size of Baltimore City. Mm -hmm. It's that big. Mm. So when you start thinking of the size of that in the scope, 13,000 houses, yes, it's a lot. But it's not like the whole city's boarded up. Yeah, yeah it's exactly. <laughs> I, I would notice that because I used to do a painting business in college. Yeah. And we would have to go literally door to door. Yep. And my neighborhood just happened to be the one with the highest, like, salaries in right. Baltimore. And I think it's like the Charles Village area. Yep. And it, it's crazy because, like, it changed my perspective because when I was doing Uber, I would have to go through every neighborhood. Right. And there, you like, you could literally see everything from, like, Edgewater where, like, you still have the heroin and, yep. and drug addicts all the way to, you know, like you said, the Charles Village, where yeah. it's like the million dollar homes. But I noticed that some of the biggest issues is food deserts and amenities and things to do. Because the, the property you showed me, the, the 12 unit, which yep. they actually completed, mm -hmm. there's no like real live grocery store there. They have mm -hmm. right. corner stores there. And I have a question to go on top of that as well, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. food deserts are uh, are a huge problem, not just in Baltimore, but in every urban uh, city. Um, but you said something about their change, like this. They're trying to change like the social uh, climate in Baltimore. So, like food does it. Like, what are some of the social uh, um, laws that they're putting together so, now? So, one of the major things that you're seeing right now is a big push for food halls. Right. So, there's several food halls under development right now. Mm -hmm. Um. And the food halls are a great opportunity because you're not only giving a small business the opportunity to have a space, mm -hmm. but you're also giving the community to have options as right. far as what they can consume as food. Mm -hmm. Wait, a food hall like so like, think about you know, like the, uh, our house, a small like restaurants or you exactly. know come together and under one roof. Oh, you okay, have okay. different options. So you have you you'll have anywhere from ten to fifteen different food options right. under one roof, mm. um, which is a huge opportunity, right? right? Yeah. But in addition, they have grants for um, corner stores to be mm. able to offer more. They have grants for grocery stores. Mm -hmm. um, they're building a new grocery store, uh, where the project you're alluding to on Reservoir Hill. So at the bottom of the hill where they're doing the major redevelopment, it is finally skyward. I'm really excited to see it off of North Avenue. Um, that project is supposed to have some type of grocer there. Uh, Reservoir Hill is one of the better neighborhoods. I mean, in Bolton Hill, you come down the houses that are priced anywhere from about 500000 up to about one point two. Um, one of my projects is over in uh, Marble Hill right there uh, that's really taken off. And then Reservoir Hill is right above that. Right. Um, they also are really embracing the arts throughout mm -hmm. Baltimore because a yeah. lot of the individuals in Baltimore, they may not have necessarily the the intellectual insight to do something, some of the high-end jobs, right. but they're very creative. Yeah, like very it's a it's a talented musical city. Um, um, I've gone to several plays in the city. It's tremendous, right? So at um, um, Drew Hill Park, they're putting an amphitheater. Mm. But let's just think about like infrastructure. It's been a major issue. Mm, it's yeah. been a major issue. So. You know, people don't understand why all the construction is going on at Drew Hill Park and some of the other reservoirs around. The big issue has been that the water supply in Baltimore was wide open. Mm. Somebody could come by with salmonella and literally just dump it in the water being supply. Being able to flint real easy. Exactly. Um, so they have literally covered all of the water supply finally with steel and concrete cages to protect it which is increasing the water supply. But there's systematic issues. They mm. sell water to Baltimore County. The water for Baltimore County comes from Baltimore City. Mm. They sell the water to Baltimore County at a lower price than citizens in Baltimore City pay for water. Yeah, because mm. I, I heard that there's a lot of times where they extrapolate the, the wealth from the city to go into the county. Yep. Like they did it with HBCUs a lot. Exactly. Um, where they took the money and then funneled it to, I think there was like a big like conflict with that, yeah. like a lawsuit where, um, like the HBCUs in the area were like, "Yo, y'all are funneling money to, to University of Maryland, to UMBC, and you're taking the money away from us." It, it was a major lawsuit that just occurred, and you know, for those in Baltimore City, Morgan State's 
campus is undergoing a major yeah, expansion. Building building. Mm-hmm. building, building. And around there, it's improved the neighborhood significantly. But one of the big reasons why, it was determined that the state had withheld about $50 million Damn. from there, Bowie State, Compton State. So all these universities mm. in the area that were HBCUs were getting money withheld from them. Mm. So now that that money has been infused, Compton State has done some beautiful things to their campus. They haven't expanded as much as Morgan, mm. but they're being able to improve that area right. as well. Didn't they just get a grant too, or are they working on that? Yeah, a lot of them are working on grants and fellowships now where they're, they're able to pull in a lot more money. Mm-hmm. They're trying to do more um, national and international research style right. projects. Mm-hmm. Um, but all of these types of things are areas of opportunity. Mm-hmm. You think about John Hopkins, John Hopkins control so much of the city. I mean, mm-hmm. they're spread out all yeah, over the city, yeah. multiple medical campuses, the college campus. And they own the most real estate. And the own the most real estate. Mm-hmm. So think about that. But you have to have those types of things in a city. Right. Baltimore has more hospitals per capita than most major cities. Mm-hmm. It's hospitals all over the city. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you got a lot of opportunity there. Um and I'm, I'm very excited about the possibilities. Uh, I think uh, Brandon Scott, the current mayor, is very insightful. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's young. He can be in office for a while. Uh, I think he has a, uh, not just great ideas. I think he's implementing great mm-hmm. things. Crime is decreasing continuously, finally. Um, so I think he's going to be a Democratic rising star. He's going to be national before. So especially right now, yeah. as a situation out there... Uh, as a way to know what we're talking about, uh, the Baltimore Bridge just collapsed yesterday. Yeah, the Francis Scott Key yeah, Bridge. So, just so that like a timestamp what we're talking about. Um, but I have a, another couple things you just said. Like in terms of that, Baltimore's also been like uh, they say it's like a leading tech center now. Like a lot of tech jobs are coming to Baltimore. It, it, it is. Uh, I've heard that. Um, I I do challenge these things. Okay. Though. And one of the reasons I challenge them is because I'll never forget when the Amazon major distribution center, this place was three blocks long when they started building it, right? Mm -hmm. It's huge. And Baltimoreans were so excited. Jobs are coming, jobs are coming, jobs are coming. Mm -hmm. One of my good friends and electricians, Tony, was working putting in the electrical. He was like, man, the amount of wire we're running in this place. And as they were completing it, he said, man, 90% of this plan is going to be automated. Yep. So when I heard that, I was like, no, nah, them jobs are not coming. <laughs> mm. So, yep. um, and then what occurred was there was a union uprising where they was pushing to have unions and they were fighting against uh, workers in Amazon having to do all this walking and stuff, not knowing that Amazon had foresight of this. And they were working on robots to go physically go down the aisle, pick up stuff off the shelf, wow. and bring it back to Packers where they could eliminate all these people walking. Mm-hmm. Yep. So it was a lot less jobs than ever was anticipated. So Amazon built this big, beautiful plant. I was over that way um, it's about like Curtis two weeks Baker, ago. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, it didn't bring as many jobs as mm. they was thinking. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, when you think about, hey, it's a tech center. Yeah, I don't know. A lot of people working from home right now. Right. You know, I live in downtown Baltimore, so it's kind of like it's a lot of vacant space. Mm-hmm. The commercial sector, not only in Baltimore, but around the country, they're trying to figure out what, what to, to do, do with, with the, all this empty space. Mm. You know, okay. so you you have to have things that are going to attract individuals. Now, I have an idea what can do it, but we'll see if they really proceed and do it. Okay. Pivoting in a different direction, you're in your early 20s and you're, you're just flying past everybody. What's going through your mind in that moment? Because like a lot of times people want to get to that position, but they don't realize that on both sides, like if you don't have money, it's stressful. But if when you do have money, it's stressful. And you were going through that with your, your uh, was she your wife at the time or? No, it wasn't my wife. It was my son's mother. But we, okay. you know. I think the biggest challenge for me, and, and it's a challenge that I still face today, right? Mm-hmm. And um, as you all move up the ladder, you're going to face it as well. You're going to lose friends along the way. You're going to lose mm-hmm. people that's close to you along the way because you're going to outgrow them. And um, fortunately, I went to a very close-knit uh, school uh, where it's like a brotherhood, and, and a lot of those brothers are still here today. But mm-hmm. even a lot of those relationships outside of that 
those individuals didn't know how to relate to me anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as you lose those situations, and even my son's mother, I mean, she wasn't maturing at the same pace as me, Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. led to kind of us having to go our separate ways to allow her to grow. Mm. Um, So you have to give other people the opportunity to grow. Um, One of my close friends, uh, Chris, he was one of the ones that saw it. My father helped him buy his first at 20. Mm. Um, Even to this day, he's one of the top realtors in the area. Uh, We're very close. Um, And, but he was one of the few that could see it. Mm -hmm. And that was like, yo, (laughs) I'm in. I'm mm-hmm. in. He actually, he moved down to Florida with me for a while, and, and we was doing it down there together for a while, you know? Right. So, um, and we met in high school. Right. Uh, but it's one of those things where when you sit back and you look and you say, hey, okay, this is some, this is a situation where I got to keep the people around me that's going to help me grow, mm-hmm. but the individuals that's not, I'm going to have to pull back. Right. I'm going to have to pull back. Okay. Um, but it gave me so much experience in so many different areas. It allowed me to be able to venture off in a different path. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's kind of, uh, we, we've learned like an overview of, of how you got here, but let's kind of pivot to how you got back home, Baltimore real estate. Yeah. So, like I said, my, my, uh, my son's mother and I went our separate ways and my son, he ended up staying with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, So I was a single father for many years from the time he was about two and a half until he was 12. Mm. Um, There are some out here. Yeah, (laughs) there definitely are. (laughs) Um, However, in Tampa, there was three major markets during the, uh, basically the mortgage and housing crash Mm -hmm. that occurred. Everybody thinks 2008. It did not start in 2008. It actually started in 07. Mm-hmm. We could see it prior to that in 06, mm-hmm. but in 07, it started in three major markets. The three major markets were California, Las Vegas proper, and Florida. Mm-hmm. So to give you an idea, at that time I had, I think I had three properties uh, that were under renovation or, or just being completed. One was on the market. I'll never forget this. I had it, had bought that property at 175000 Put a bunch of money into it. I had it on the market at uh, three fifteen. It was like four blocks away from the golf course um, up in North Tampa near Bush uh, Bush Gardens. Beautiful house. Set on three lots. Had a boat pad on the side. I put a circular driveway in mm-hmm. the front. Market started to crash. Mm. When the market started to crash, it basically I'm chasing the market down from three fifteen. Mm. Drop it two seventy five. 235, mm, 200. Damn. I go to 175, can't sell this property. I finally look at my son, my mom, saying, hey, you need to consider coming back to family, this and that. You just keeping the baby boy away from us, all of that. So I was like, you know, I started thinking because, like, the market's dying at this point, mm-hmm. right? Right. So I'll never forget, I packed him up. We packed up. I sold, sold my work truck, packed up my BMW. And uh, took the auto train back to D.C. Mm. One of my private lenders, I'd done a bunch of work with um, Glenn Coker over at Fort Brook. Um, Ended up going ahead and doing a deed in lieu. Okay? A deed in lieu, a foreclosure Mm -hmm. on several of the properties. And what that was was basically me signing, instead of them going through the foreclosure, signing the properties over to him. He's like, Tony, we made a lot of money together. Um... Sign these over to me. You walk away, keep your credit, you're good. Mm. I was like, okay. I'll never forget. A year and a half later, I went back and looked what, and every time I go back down to Tampa, I still go down to Tampa because my son is down that area, right? Uh, So I often ride by a lot of my properties when I'm down there. And uh, Glenn ended up selling that property for $100,000. Fully renovated. Wow. Good <laughs> grief. That's a seventy five K law. Well, seventy five K didn't we not even account for holding costs. Not holding costs, not my renovation costs, none of that. I lost 130 grand wow. on that property. I lost 130 mm. grand on that property because I was heavy cashing on that particular property. Mm. And the drink started at 315. Exactly. Damn. So um uh, when I say you, you know, when you talk about learning lessons from failures. You know, I, I'm a lot more conservative now, mm. a lot more conservative because of that. 
But that's what brought me back to the area. And when I first came back, of course, in 08, because I came back at the end of 07, basically going into January, mm-hmm. the whole world started to crash. Mm. I'm still doing loans at this point. And literally, I was with four companies in the course of like six months because the first company I was with, quote me a rate, they went up in smoke. I went to Apex Mortgage. They went up in smoke. <sighs> uh, I was with Mortgage IT. They were on Wall Street. <laughs> they went down when Lehman Brothers went up mm-hmm. in smoke. So it was one after another. And it was basically a situation where I had a bunch of money saved up, fortunately, and I just got out of real estate completely. And I ended up getting in the entertainment side, promotions again. Um, saw working over at, um, it, everybody knows it at Dream, but it, it changed the name at that point to Love. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was working with Mark and Taz over there doing promotions um, and started a modeling agency. So I did that for like a year and a half, two years. Wow. Chris, Chris was getting his appraisals license and ended up calling me about... I guess about a year and a half after me running a modeling agency and everything. And he was like, yo, it's an opportunity for us to start buying properties off the MLS. It's like, what you talking about? So we started looking at numbers. And at this time, you got short sales and you got foreclosures. Tons of them. Mm-hmm. Heavy. Yeah. Heavy. I mm. remember. So we started Just prime flipping buying. like crazy. Hold on, hold on. What's MLS? So the MLS is the multiple listing system, Okay. Um, it's multiple listing service. What that is, is basically where real estate agents, um, put properties to be able to share with one another that they're listed on the market for sale. Kind of like a Zillow for regular people like us, MLS. Right. And this was pre Zillow, but this is where we would log in and be able to see properties. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't have my real estate license at this time, but I still have my father's access at that, that at that time. So I'm able to see these numbers and we sit down, we look at them. Like, yo, let's hop back in. Mm-hmm. So I hop back in, still running a uh running the uh modeling agency at the same time. So I'm doing pretty well with that. Not making a bunch of money, but having success placing models and various print ads and, and shows and stuff. And um I was very close to uh John Blasting Game, who's the um uh publisher of Black Men magazine at that time and Hype Hair and several other publications. So I used to do a lot of shows right. with him up in Jersey. While there, at a show, I met my business partner now. And uh, Mr. Red, we, we, we're up there doing a show, and we connect on Facebook. So I come back. Chris and I are doing a renovation over on, on uh, Sheriff Road. Mm-hmm. And, or maybe it was Mitchville. I'm not sure which one we were doing at that time. But anyway, he sees it when I'm posting some content. I'm doing content back then on Facebook. Mm. Um, He sees it and he says, uh, yo, you in real estate? It's like, yeah, dude, I bought my first house at 19. (laughs) Does it? He's like, he's like, yo, y'all next project, I want in. I was like, where are you? You in the business? He's like, yeah, I've been in it since like 2000. I was like, okay, cool. And I met several other people in the modeling industry mm-hmm. that also was heavy in the real estate. I was like, wow. Mm. So basically, our relationship evolved from him just being an investor to where we are today. Chris, his appraisal business ended up really taking off. Um, so we kind of went our separate ways as far as investing together. Right. Um, but it became a scenario whereby... Red kind of stepped in, mm-hmm. and we are, we're where we at today. Um, I kind of got out of the D.C. marketplace in, I guess, about 2014, 2015. I got out of the D.C. marketplace. I was building condos uh, throughout the city, doing a bunch of stuff, um, but kind of got out of the market because the numbers became so tight. If you all remember... DC markets ran up like crazy. Shot uh-huh. up. Like, shot like, up. That's crazy. Like, almost 100% yeah. shot up. So 2012 was probably my last rehab in this area. Mm-hmm. And then I just went like heavy on the condo side. Right. So, um, you know, doing basically converting four unit buildings, two unit buildings, single family houses into condos, doing ground up construction, built my personal house um, in D.C. That was about 5,500 square feet, all of that good stuff. So as I did that, 
it was like, okay, this market is insane. These numbers is insane. You can't keep up. To give you an idea, I had one property um, in Upper Northwest, Kennedy Street. No My dude. carrying cost on that property each month was $23,000. Golly. I think I remember you telling me that one. Yeah. 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 So when you start looking at those types of numbers yeah. where you're carrying a mortgage of like mm -hmm. 1.8, you got private money on it, mm -hmm. you know, 1.8 mil private money, high interest rate, you're still getting, mm -hmm. <laughs> got to yeah. get materials and everything yeah. else. You got all these contractors relying yeah. on you. You got OSHA up your butt about ladders not being yeah, attached exactly. to stuff, all exactly. types of stuff, right? Because you're, you're you're working in a different marketplace than a regular rehab. For, mm -hmm. for those who don't know, OSHA is the Occupational Safety Hazard Correct. Association. Correct. So, for instance, we got one fine on site because a ladder wasn't tied off mm -hmm. to the wall. Mm -hmm. That fine was $15,000. Damn. Goodness gracious. Yeah. Goodness yeah, so that's just to give you an idea, a <laughs> little background, right? So, so um, how did I get to Baltimore? Mm. So just to fast forward, I'm like, um, Red and I and our, one of our other partners, we flew out to Detroit to meet with one of my homegirls, Asia. Asia's big out there. She's a general contractor. Um awesome person right so i was like asia we coming out we want to see what this market offers so while we're out here it took red from new york and rock took them two flights to get to detroit mm -hmm. took me two flights basically you know we had layovers so we get out there we looking around and red says something to me that's key he says uh dude this ain't nothing but baltimore why are we going to invest out here when we could do that? Baltimore is only two, two, three hours from me, and it's an hour from you. <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. We'll explore it when I get back. Because I own property. I had a rental property up there previously. Um, In fact, I think I shared with you about having the water meter line insurance because of that very property. Mm -hmm. Um, So anyway... We came back, and immediately I started looking at Baltimore. And I was like, this is it. This is it. So we jumped in that market up there. That was We actually jumped in the market up there, I think it was 2019. Mm. We started really going hard looking into the market. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, and it's been, it's been a major, major blessing mm -hmm. to be able to move up there and to see, and I had done speaking engagements and Participated with meetups and everything else with investors up there. I had a whole network of investors that I knew in Baltimore already from years right. of going back and forth up there. BWI meetup um, uh, and other stuff that I've been a part of going to the real deal meetup. So it was a thing where it wasn't hard having contacts in the market, mm -hmm. but I got there. Okay. I got a quick question before you go because look like you want to ask a question. You said the car holding costs were uh, twenty three thousand. For those who are not familiar with holding costs, what exactly are holding costs? So holding costs. So you got your actual mortgage payment, okay. In mm -hmm. that case, it was an interest only payment, right. okay. You got your taxes that you're paying. In addition to that, you also got your utilities, everything from your electric to your water that you're paying as well. Um, and then you also have something called builder's risk insurance. Mm -hmm. Builder's risk insurance is something that you carry on the property while you're doing construction. Right. Okay, it's covering your materials and any liabilities that happen on mm -hmm. the job site. So all of those costs are included in those carrying costs. Now, you have other costs involved, but those are the main carrying costs that you have to factor in. Mm -hmm. The majority of that 23000 was the interest-only payment that I was making at that time. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, yo, yeah. Definitely, this is definitely gonna have part to run my this back. <laughs> definitely gonna have to run this back. Yo, Tony, you gave a lot of game. Um, man, you you definitely delivered <laughs> today. I we, we appreciate that. We appreciate most that. Most definitely, most definitely. And definitely, we, um, definitely, if you're interested in more about the Baltimore market in particular, definitely follow Tony everywhere. Are you on YouTube as of yet? Uh, we got three channels that's getting ready to launch. One for the Baltimore market. It's going to be under Be More Urban Life. 
We do have DC Urban Life launching and Philly mm. Urban Life launching. All three of those channels are going to be launching within the next three to four weeks. Tough. It's a lot of content that's already been shot to educate you on the market. Right. So um, definitely tap in. Um, and I look forward to connecting with you all. If you do connect with me on IG, go right to the link in the bio and you're able to get a free 15 minute consultation. Uh, anything real estate. Ask me anything real estate. I'm here to help. Exactly, exactly. And we will leave everything. We'll put all his information in the description and we'll also leave up his um, IG and stuff throughout the video as well. Um, look, if you're definitely interested in Baltimore, check out Tony. Check out, I don't want to plug them because they might be rivals. I'm sorry. <laughs> but they did help me out as well. Yep. Uh, definitely uh, plug into Charm City Buyers. Definitely. Um, definitely. Like support they, them. They, they are really deep about in, in Baltimore. Really deep. And um, Alex, you have anything to close out with? Anything you want to... No, you got a quote. <laughs> All right, well, like, well, 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 if Alex yeah. doesn't have anything, yo, uh, again, thank you, Tony, for your gems. Thank you, man. Uh, thank y'all for checking us out, and peace. Oh, Baltimore can be built up, but at the same time, we've been waiting on Baltimore for 20, 30 years.